At this time, I would like to um, invite Prince Alex up to give the award for best oralist in the moot. Um, and to just let everybody know that we'll take a very short break um, after that and begin with panel um, with panel two at 2.35. Thank you again um, to all the students who participated in the moot. Um, I'll start by giving out these certificates of participation um, and then with announcement for the best oral list um, last. Um, the first certificate for of participation goes to Naomi Mojinga Malumba. Thank you. And next is Juan David Asinegas Parra. Juan was the only um, counsel for the claimant after his um, co counsel dropped out. So good job, Juan. Thank you. And the last certificate goes to Benjamin Allen. Thank you. And our best artist is Benjamin Allen. <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah. OK. Thank you. Now turning to our second panel, which uh, will explore the uh, institutional landscape for arbitration in Africa. Um, I hope that our um, panelists from the first panel will hang around and we're giving them kind of a, um, a executive license to raise their hand and make contributions as we go through because um, it would be a, a, a shame to waste that much kind of um, um, uh, brain power while it's sitting in the room. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Victoria, who is our moderator and the former chair of the African Affairs Committee here at the New York City Bar. Thank you all for being here. I'm Victoria Safran, and I'm a partner with Sa Setner Safran LLP. And as mentioned, the former chair and a current member of the New York City Bar African Affairs Committee. And our committee, along with the ADR, the arbitration, and the international law committees, are delighted to co-sponsor this event. We extend a special thanks to the CPR Institute and the 2023 AAD New York Steering Committee and welcome everyone here today. Uh, our panel is going to discuss the role of arbitral institutions and the future of ad hoc arbitration in Africa. I'm going to begin with um, introductions. On my far left is Dr. Mohamed Swafi. Mohamed is a bilingual dual qualified attorney at Hinshaw and Culbertson Kalber LLP, has experienced counseling, arbitrating, and litigating complex commercial and investment in cross-border disputes under major arbitration rules. His practice spans civil and common law jurisdictions, and he handles international disputes before arbitral tribunals seated in different jurisdictions and before state and federal courts in the U.S. He's also had prosecutorial experience in the Middle East, where he handled government corruption and financial crimes investigation, and he's also an adjunct professor at Fordham Law School. Some of Mohammed's many professional accomplishments include serving as a delegate of the ICC Commission on Arbitration and ADR. He's currently the youngest accredited arbitrator at the American Arbitration Association, and he's chair of the International Dispute Resolution Committee at the New York State Bar Association. In 22, he was awarded Africa's 30 Most Promising Arbitration Practitioners Award, and in 2021, he was awarded the Middle East Policy Center 40 Under 40 Award. Congratulations, Mohammed, <laughs> and welcome to the panel. Um, our next panelist is Melita Hodgson. She's a partner in Arnold and Porter's New York office, and she's a recognized investor state and commercial arbitration practitioner. She also sits as, ar as an arbitrator. 
Her areas of expertise include mining, infrastructure, construction, and post-M&A disputes. Melita is a former Associate General Counsel at the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative, where she worked on disputes at the WTO, as well as negotiations of free trade agreements and bilateral investment treaties. She's the president-elect of the American Society of International Law. Thanks for being here today, Melita. And our third panelist next to me is Prince Alex Iwu. He's an associate at Diaz Royce and Targ's Miami office, where he focuses his practice on international dispute resolution and the firm's Africa desk. He also represents clients in state and federal courts in New York and Florida. Before joining DS Royce, Prince Alex practiced litigation at AELEX, one of Nigeria's most prominent international law firms, where he acted in cross-border litigations and advised corporations such as Uber BV, Shell, Coca-Cola, Hellenic, and other multinationals operating in Nigeria. And thank you, Prince Alex, for making a very late flight from Miami and joining us here today. Thank you. Um, I'm going to dive right into it. Our first question goes to Mohammed. And Mohammed, could you um, please address the key considerations that are relevant uh, for choosing between ad hoc arbitration and institutional arbitration in Africa? Uh, yeah, of course. Thank you so much, Victoria, for the kind introduction. And I would. Uh, thank uh, the International Institute for Conflict Prevention and uh, uh, Resolution, the CPR, and the New York City uh, uh, Bar Association for hosting that uh, a very important and timely event uh, today. And thanks to the steering committee, thanks to Nawi and Mohanad for organizing such a fascinating and uh, first of its kind uh, uh, conference about Africa arbitration. Um, so I will get uh, directly into it because uh, 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 Victoria asked me to. So um, first of all, the matter of ad hoc versus institutional arbitration, much is often made of the differences between the two. Arbitral institutions have played a critical role in professionalizing the arbitral process. Their rules provide predictability about how the arbitral process will be conducted. Clearly, there are advantages to institutional arbitration, including detailed institutional rule book, predictability of published practices and commentary, judicious exercise of default appointment powers, self-standing challenge mechanisms, predetermined fee parameters, and oversight of arbitrator diligence and so forth. All of these are advantages which competent institutions bring to the process. I stress competent because little has been written or even said about the other variety, the incompetent. And if one looks beyond the leading African arbitral institutions, one can find hundreds of institutions in Africa purporting to offer end-to-end -end arbitral services, many of which are either incompetent and in some cases are shockingly corrupt. The corrupt ones must be clearly denounced to the parties, to the courts, to the community of practitioners, and if necessary, to the investigating authorities. But the incompetent institutions present even greater difficulties and they can be much more numerous. But the larger point is that the choice of ad hoc or institutional arbitration is typically made long before expert arbitration counsel is being retained in the dispute. In addition, whether or not one agrees to institutional rather than ad hoc arbitration might depend on how much, how much publicity one wishes to attract for one's particular claim. It can be said that competent arbitral institutions are excellent help, but they are less than we incline to believe. Incompetent arbitral institutions are worse than none and are much more numerous than we like to think. And ad hoc arbitration works perfectly well, given good judges and good arbitrators. That leads me to discuss my second point to address this question, which is the role of the judiciary. This role is more obvious, of course, in ad hoc more than institutional arbitration. Apart from corruption and integrity issues, judicial independence in Africa is a critical aspect of dispute resolution, especially with the state entities playing a major role in international commercial affairs. However, the quality of judges 
exercising support and review functions over the arbitral process can determine the success and failure of that process, either in ad hoc or institutional arbitration. In this respect, as in many others, the world in general and Africa in particular seems to divide more or less along economic and financial lines with the richer countries dedicating larger budgets to the legal education in general and the administration of justice in particular, and poorer countries being constrained to make the opposite choice with foreseeable results in both cases. I'm not suggesting for a moment that all competent judges reside in those rich countries, but I'm suggesting that you are much more likely to come across someone who knows a great deal about the theory and the practice of arbitration in those other jurisdictions than elsewhere. And that when you do come across someone who doesn't, good luck. I move next to my third and penultimate point on this issue, which is the environmental stability of the arbitral process. Arbitral institutions do not take away the flexibility of the arbitral process. Rather, they provide a more predictable and stable legal environment for arbitration. They define with greater details the powers of the arbitrators. They require arbitrators to do things at particular times. They make sure that arbitral tribunals actually do their job properly in accordance with the rules. But the challenge here is, do all the arbitrators always do a good job? Unfortunately, they don't. They take an arbitral institution to make sure that they are doing things on time to make sure that their compensation is geared to their performance and to make sure that the parties are aware of the benefits and weaknesses of different arbitrators compared to others. Obviously, if the parties can decide in a tailor-made arbitral procedure after a dispute arises, they can devise a, mean, a means of dispute resolution that is more efficient, better tailored to their individual dispute than a one-size-fits-all set of procedures that they take off the shelf. The expedition of the, of the process will ensure that the reasons that businessmen and women choose arbitration will be realized. I move now to my final point to answer this question, which is the regulation of arbitral institutions in Africa. In Africa, there is no clear set of criteria as to what constitutes an arbitral institution and who can serve as one. That may open the door for unpredictable practices and standards for different arbitral institutions and may open the door ultimately to corruption. Recently in Egypt, where I am originally from, the Egyptian Court of Cassation, which is the highest court in Egypt, decided in one case that there are specific criteria to determine what constitutes an arbitral institution. It decided that a permanent arbitral institution is one that has the following characteristics. First, it is established based on regional convention, legislation, or any other law with the purpose of administering international commercial disputes. Second, it must also be universally or regionally reputable and well-known, and it must gain participant confidence in the field of international and commercial businesses. And finally, it must have a stable administrative mechanism that is weighed by the practical experience and the regular administration of arbitral disputes. However, when we look at these criteria, we find that they can only apply to the existing arbitral institutions with long history of handling arbitration cases, not the newly established ones. And actually, when we apply these criteria in Egypt, it will apply only to the Cairo Regional Center, which is the most reputable center in Egypt. That's the challenge, and that may affect the confidence in the newly emerging arbitral institutions in Africa. And these are the main uh, uh, four concerns that I have in considering whether to choose institutional or ad hoc arbitration in Africa. Thank you, Mohammed. Melita, can you um, give us your thoughts on, on the same issue? Sure, and I would also, excuse me, like to thank CPR and uh, the Bar Association for um, inviting me and, and the organizers of, of uh, the first Africa Arbitration Day for inviting me to participate. Uh, I listened, it was very interesting to me because it wasn't the traditional sort of, you know, ad hoc, you get to do things, you know, run things yourself and be more in charge of it, whereas institution provides sort of security, predictability, but in, in some ways it was uh, the same thing, but I, I was surprised to, to learn your views that um, there are a lot of issues around incompetence, yeah. um, not necessarily, well, 
corruption. Yes, that's that. I, I wasn't shocked to hear that, but the incompetence <laughs> part, I, I, I was. So um, that for me is interesting because I'm definitely coming at it from a Western view that an institution is better. Uh, and the reason I say that is I think it's very hard once you're in a dispute to actually agree on key features of a process, you know, because you think that it's giving an advantage to the other side. I mean, it's hard enough to agree these days to a president, let's say, of a three-person tribunal or to a sole arbitrator, because you're wondering if one side suggests that person, you know, what's the what's behind it, or is is it, we've just gotten to such a point that. Uh, it seems it would be really difficult to yeah. to run an ad hoc arbitration, uh, particularly mm -hmm. if you're somewhere where there's not a lot of arbitration or there's not a lot of experience with arbitration. So I found that surprising, but I, I would still caution, I guess, that, you know, the sort of perhaps as bad as the institutions may be, that the problem with ad hoc is going to be that it, it's, you know, you may get stalled and that's going to be sort of disadvantageous for at least one party. <laughs> Thanks very much. And then turning to um, African arbitration institutions, Prince Alex, can you address what some of the most promising um, arbitration institutions are in Africa? Yeah, thank you. So I think if, while I mean, there are a couple that, you know, come to mind um, readily. I think practitioners think about um, the promising arbitral institutions in terms of um, not just where they're ranked, but um, in terms of which ones give them an experience that probably approximates to what they've had um, elsewhere, say with the ICC. And it, it, it's probably it's probably going to be difficult to find um, an arbitral institution in Africa that pro provides an experience that that approximates to what you'll have with the ICC. However, I, I, I think that's not um, a challenge that's unique to the African arbitral institutions. Um, we, it's probably the case for um, institutions even in Asia. But with respect to Africa, there was a survey in 2020, um, and there were a couple of surveys, but the one in 2020 by um, the School of um, Oriental and African Studies is probably the most comprehensive in terms of um, some of the metrics it looked at in, in identifying um, the top arbitral institutions. And some of those, um, I'll give the top five, are the Arbitration Foundation of South Africa. Um, the second is the Cairo Regional Center for International Commercial Arbitration. And the third is the Ugadugu Arbitration and Mediation and Conciliation Center. The fourth is the Ohada Common Court of Justice um, and Arbitration Center. And the fifth is the Kigali International Arbitration Center. I tried, I don't know if the presentation is up, but then there, there are some numbers that are helpful in appreciating. Okay, so um, numbers that are helpful in appreciating why these five institutions are probably ranked as the top five um, based on their caseload. So for the AFSA, which is the um, African Found Arbitration Foundation of Southern Africa. The number of cases under its own rules are a little over, over 4,000 cases. And for the um, Cairo Regional Center, um, a little over 1,400 cases. For the Ogadugu um, Arbitration and Mediation Center, um, a little over or close to 200 cases. And the CCJ, 157 and the KIAC 137. However, the, the survey didn't just work, you know, rank the arbitral institutions based on the, the, the caseload. It also tried to um, rank them based on what practitioners are, uh, practitioners of um, arbitration in Africa. That doesn't mean practitioners of African descent, but anyone who is a practitioner who regular, regularly um, arbitrated um, in Africa or uh, before those institutions and try to see what their thoughts were on what they thought about the best institutions. And you'll see that in the next slide. And it, it I mean, those, oh, sorry, my bad. All right, so um, these five arbitral institutions are somewhat similar to the first five, 
um, and you'd see that um, the uh, three of the first five institutions, and I'll go back just to make that point. So you would see that the AFSA, the um, Cairo Regional Center, and I think um, Nairobi Center for International Arbitration are reflected on that list, the first list. But if you were to look at the second list of um, top arbitration centers, there are two new um, two new institutions there, and, and those are the Legal School of Arbitration and um, the Kigali International Arbitration Center. And it's understandable why, you know, there are differences between this list, this list and, and, and the other. Uh, for instance, the Legal School of Arbitration is a fairly um, new um, international arbitration um, institution, um, probably less than 10 or 15 years old. But it's on that list because, and I think that it reflects the, uh, and I'm Nigerian, but it reflects the biases of um, the respondents um, to that survey who have probably interacted a lot more with the Lagos Code of Arbitration, even though it doesn't have a significant caseload that it, it doesn't even show up if you were to look again at that list. The Lagos Code of Arbitration doesn't show up on, on the list of the, um, you know, uh, based on the caseload, but it does on, on this other um list. So the third um, list uh, is also similar to the first two, but it sort of um, aggregates what the respondents thought about which of the institutions provided the most support for, for them during the arbitrations. And 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 that third list um, is similar to, to the second. I think the bottom line is that um, while you may not find arbitral institutions, like I said initially, that provide an experience similar to what you have with the ICC or the SIAC, or any other of the you know more renowned institutions anywhere in the world, these arbitral institutions do what they're supposed to do, have the competence to you know provide um, the service that um, users need, and and hopefully with time you know they ac acquire the reputation that makes um, users of our international arbitration think about them first, at least with respect to Africa um, uh, or other arbitrations that arise from Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Prince Alex. And Mohammed, can you um, give us your thoughts on the most promising African arbitration institutions? Yeah, of course. Um, first, I would like to thank Prince, and I would say that I love your name. So, um, uh, and I'm sure it's a name and it's an adjective. So that's great. Um, the uh, the most promising African arbitral institutions. I think I think that would relate to the my point that I was making between uh, a difference between uh, competent and incompetent uh, arbitral institutions in Africa. Because when we look at these like top five or top ten arbitral institutions in Africa, they are all competent uh, arbitral institutions because of the services that they provide to the arbitration users and uh, because of the reputation that they have built over time uh, uh, and the trust uh, uh, that they have also built with the arbitration users. Uh, over handling the cases. But I think that is still the problem that we might have in Africa is the absence of regulation uh, uh, of the arbitral institutions and what criteria can we have uh, for uh, 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 what constitutes an arbitral institution. Because uh, listen, the, the, according to the survey, there are more than 100 arbitral institutions right now in Africa. But when we talk about the most promising or the most reputable ones, we can just count them like by five or six. So that's not good for the uh, arbitration practice in Africa. And I think uh, 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 there is also an obligation for the most promising arbitral institutions to provide more clarity on the best practices so that the other and the new emerging arbitral institutions look at these institutions by an inspiring eye because they will always look at these institutions to see how they do the job in order to follow their steps. So I think that's a very important uh, uh, aspect that we should look at. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm going to continue with you, Mohammed, because you gave us uh, a good understanding of the key considerations that go into uh, choosing between ad hoc or institutional arbitration. And now can you explain, because like Melita, coming from a Western perspective, I'm thinking, of course you would choose an institutional arbitration. So I'm very eager to hear why there is a preference for ad hoc over institutional arbitration in Africa. 
Well, thank you, Victoria. The good news is in Nigeria, according to the studies, uh, parties uh, historically have preferred to opt for ad hoc more than institutional arbitration. So that's uh, the good news. Uh, however, when we look at this topic, we should uh, we should look at the context to determine the party's preference for one choice over another. Arguments of party autonomy, jurisdictional propriety, arbitral justice, and the institutional environment of arbitration would determine the propriety of the individual or the institutional choice to administer the arbitration process. According to a recent survey, the top five African arbitral seats are South Africa, Nigeria, Egypt, Rwanda, and Cote d'Ivoire. But Africa is not just about these five arbitral seats. Africa has 54 countries, which means that there are still 49 other jurisdictions in Africa that are not as hot as these arbitral seats, these five arbitral seats. I believe that the first reason for preferring ad hoc over institutional arbitration is the absence of trust in the institutional arbitration and the fear of incompetent arbitral institutions. In Africa, as Prince uh, probably, uh, probably pointed out, there are currently more than 100 arbitral institutions. And from these more than 100 arbitral institutions in Africa, the top five arbitral centers, according to a 2020 survey by the School of Oriental and African Studies, are the Arbitration Foundation of South, uh, Southern Africa, the Cairo Regional Center for International Commercial Arbitration, the Kigali International Arbitration Center, the Lagos Court of Arbitration, and the Nairobi Center for International Arbitration. And these are exactly examples of what competent institutions in Africa are. However, there are some other examples of incompetent or even corrupt institutions. And a good example for that is uh, a dispute that has arisen uh, before and it was conducted in Egypt, it's very uh, well known to be like a Chevron dispute. And this dispute simply was uh, some Saudi investors, they had an agreement, it's a concession agreement back to 1940 or 1950. And this agreement had an arbitration agreement that states that the arbitration will be conducted in case of a dispute, of course, the arbitration will be ad hoc and the place of arbitration will be Geneva. This arbitration was conducted in Egypt and before a center called International Arbitration Center. And when we look at the details of that, there is no regulation for what is called International Arbitration Center. And actually, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the parties have appointed uh, an arbitral tribunal and the first tribunal issued a decision saying that we have no jurisdiction, however, the International Arbitration Center continued to consider that dispute and the, they reconstituted another arbitral tribunal that said that, oh, yeah, we have a jurisdiction and they issued an award in the absence of the respondent. And they got that award and they came to the United States before the Southern District in California and in Texas. But both petition to confirm that award were denied by the court for the procedural irregularity. But that brings me back to the issue of what constitutes an arbitral institution? Because the, the, the conduct of that institution in this case raised many concerns about the role of arbitral institutions in, in enhancing the legitimacy of the commercial arbitration regime in general in Asia. And these concerns would eventually weigh for the party's choice to pursue an ad hoc rather than institutional arbitration in an arbitration friendly jurisdiction. The second challenge that may favor ad hoc over institutional arbitration, in my view, is what I would call excessive transparency. There are currently global calls for advocating for more transparency. In fact, arbitral institutions are key players in answering these calls. These are absolutely commendable calls. We simply need more transparency in the arbitration system, and arbitration institutions are taking the lead in that role. One manifestation of this transparency is now the call for more publication of arbitral awards. If the African arbitral institutions adopt this approach, commercial parties would steer away from arbitral institutions to avoid getting their awards published, of course, with some exceptions, where the commercial parties seek publicity to their claims, but generally, this is not the case. Commercial parties may still prefer to avoid this possibility. In my current practice as U.S. counsel, 
I represent uh, through my firm a lot of worldwide financial institutions and corporations. And from my own experience, I can say that publicity is a crucial concern for the clients and confidentiality is a key factor in choosing one forum over another to adjudicate the dispute. The other problem with the publication of the awards is that they would contribute to creating a presidential role for the arbitral awards. And of course, we can see that in the vein of the exit uh, awards. But business entities do not want or prefer that. My third challenge that may my my third point that may favor ad hoc over institutional arbitration is the the choice of the arbitrator. The choice of the arbitrator is perhaps the most important decision the council may ever make in the arbitration proceeding. Some arbitral institutions now interfere in this choice by determining that only one arbitrator will, will be appointed if, if the dispute amount does not exceed certain limits. A downside of the institutional arbitration is the choice of the arbitrators where the institution chooses all the arbitrators and the institutions dictate the entry terms for those who will serve on the institutional list of arbitrators. Parties may prefer to escape the constraints of the institutional rules to freely appoint the number of arbitrators they agreed upon, even in default appointments. Of course, the counter argument would be the institutions look at efficiency. In addition, in ad hoc arbitration, some parties may use court intervention to delay and frustrate the arbitral proceedings, whether it's started yet or pending. If the international arbitration dispute involves non-African parties, the intricacies of the national procedures may also be unknown to one or more of the parties, and this may exacerbate the choice of the ad hoc or institutional arbitration. Relatedly, most of the African arbitral institutions still do not have majority of African arbitrators on their list. And that may, uh, and these lists may mainly consist of non-African uh, arbitrators. Of course, they intend in good faith to attract many of the big names in the arbitration field into the jurisdiction where these arbitral institutions practice, but that's not always a good approach. To the users of international arbitration in Africa, it is possible to argue that it makes more sense to hold their arbitration proceedings outside Africa or to escape the institutional arbitration to ad hoc arbitration if they, prefer, if they prefer to freely choose African arbitrators and not just be limited to, to the institutions list that lack sufficient African arbitrators. And these are the points that I believe may contribute to the council's choice between ad hoc and institutional arbitration in Africa. Thanks very much. And um, Melita, I wanted to uh, get your thoughts on the same issue. Uh, well, once again, uh, some interesting uh, thoughts that I hadn't um, considered. So I, I don't think there's any need to talk about the party autonomy part. I, I think everybody gets that. Um, uh, I thought your term excessive transparency was interesting. Um, I, from a, a sort of macro level, I'll, I'll just say that the, I, I think particularly for arbitration in, in Africa, and I, I could be wrong, but I think at least the the, let's say the high ticket item arbitrations likely involve states mm -hmm. and state-owned entities. And I think that when you have something where a significant, I don't know, $11 billion is at risk or something, uh, or something that's going to significantly affect a state's budget, then you should have transparency mm -hmm. uh, about the whole process. And so I think that it may be that if it's a straight commercial, commercial transaction and you want to have ad hoc arbitration, that's fine. But I think where state, state entities are involved, uh, I, I think there's there should be some kind of requirement of transparency. So can we say that transparency is a relative term that may differ from state entities arbitration disputes to uh, commercially uh, uh, commercial parties disputes? Um, it. It could be. I, I, you know, I, I, in my experience, and in particular sitting as arbitrator, most parties don't, you know, if they're asked, the ICC will ask. Yeah. And the parties will say, no, we don't want it. Published. So you, you still get that yeah. from uh, an institution. But I do think that taking, taking these kinds of cases, um, you know, as the majority of cases, then we're not there yet to to say it's it's excessive. Um, and I would say also that in terms of 
I, I thought your point about diversity was interesting because one of the, the things that, that I was thinking about transparency is that, you know, it puts the, the institution's feet to the fire for them to show who are they appointing. Yeah. So I think it's interesting that, that what you say is that actually the arbitral institutions in Africa don't really have as much diversity um, as as one would expect. So um, that was different. <laughs> I would say I would qualify that with some exceptions, of course. So. <laughs> okay, um, Melita, we're going to uh, continue with you. And now we will uh, turn to the role um, that the OHADA Court of Justice and Arbitration um, and what role you think it should play in international arbitration in Africa. Sure. And I, my guess is that many of you have not heard of OHADA or hadn't heard about it before today. Um, and I know when Prince Alex mentioned uh, uh, CCJ, probably you were like, CC, what is that? Um, so I don't know very much about it, until, or at least I learned a little bit more about it. What I remember of OHADA was the controversy, I would say about five, six years ago, when uh, some esteemed arbitrators had negotiated their fees uh, and the CCJ, which is uh, the Common Court of uh, Justice and Arbitration, which is part of OHADA, um, uh, decided that that was inconsistent with the rules. They'd not approved it and annulled an award on that basis. Uh, that created a lot of controversy and coverage. Uh, and so that's how I remember hearing about OHADA. But what I will say is OHADA is a, is a French acronym. I will not butcher the French. Uh, <laughs> suffice it to say that it's a, an organization for the harmonization of business law in Africa. Uh, it's been around for 30 years, essentially. Uh, it's primarily um, consists of 17 uh, countries that have not all, but most of them have sort of a French uh, background or French colonial background. Um, OHADA itself sort of operates under the principle of nine uniform acts, which governs a number of commercial activities um, and have laws or regulations or, or um, guidance rega regarding these activities. Uh, so one of the ways that it promotes the harmonization and the development of the law is through the um, the CCJA, uh, which is governed by a Uniform Act on, on Arbitration or Uniform Act on Arbitration Law. And there is a center. It sits in uh, Abidjan in the Côte d'Ivoire. There's there are 13 judges, uh, seven uh, non-renewable, seven year non-renewable term. Uh, issued its first decision in 2001, and um, uh, as an institution, as a regional arbitration center, I think has gained uh, a, a lot of respect, and, and really by having its its uh, being tested um, by by fire. Uh, you know, what role um, has it played? Can it play? Uh, you know, it's pronounced on various different uh, areas that govern. Um, govern uh, commercial transactions or interactions uh, with African parties or international parties also. Um, uh, foreclosure, protection of creditors, uh, purchase, purchase, sale, purchase, business combinations, uh, bankruptcy, and more generally, business law. Um, you know, one of the very interesting features is that it acts essentially as, as a supranational court. I mean, it is both uh, an arbitral institution that administers, it has its own rules, but it also sits essentially as a, as a nullment court and as a determiner of enforcement. Uh, and sometimes parties have found that out to their, their dismay. I mean, the recognition by the president of the CCJA makes an award enforceable in all 17 jurisdictions. Uh, that's, you know, it sounds like the EU's dream, really. Um, and so it, it can also give advisory opinions. Um, uh, and is moving on. There, there is consideration now. There is study, I guess, uh, regarding mediation, adding mediation as a feature uh, of some of the, the CCJA's responsibility. So I mentioned before that it's had some controversy. Uh, in 2015, uh, um, 
it had refused to annul a case in which a civil servant uh, was appointed a sole arbitrator in a case involving a state-owned entity from the state which in which he was a civil servant. <laughs> um, uh, he had been appointed over at least an initial objection, but the reasoning was that the party, even after the, the arbitrator formally disclosed that he was indeed a civil servant of this state, um, and the entity involved was a fairly powerful entity in that state, the, the party did not object, did not formally challenge uh, the arbitrator, and except, of course, when the award came and the award was not favorable. Um, uh, and then I mentioned before the, the case about the arbitrators, three, um, well, two, two, I would say, were Western, uh, and one Spanish, one French. Um, I don't know where Mr. Fatala is. He Egyptian? Uh, Mr. Lebanese. 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 Um, uh, <laughs> where the the fees were set for the arbitrators at 60,000 60, euros, whereas the fees for the institution, not unreasonably, was 90,000. They sought to get uh, the fees increased. Uh, the chair, at least, believed that there was an agreement from the institution to raise the fees, uh, and it was not. So then they entered into an agreement with the parties to increase the fees to something to the effect of 430,000 euros or something. Uh, CCJA annulled the award because they said it was outside the mandate of the arbitrators. Um, so as I say, this caused a lot of controversy. And I, I think there's a legitimate question as to why the CCJ really thought 60,000 euros was a fair um, uh, remuneration. But at any rate, lots of accusations about not supporting arbitrators and, and we're being anti-arbitrators. Uh, Somewhat more recently, the Paris Court of Appeals upheld the primacy of treaty over municipal law by upholding an award where Cameroon challenged uh, an award where the claimant had changed the seat uh, before bringing the claim after a concession contract had been canceled. And the court basically said, um, you know, the Cameroon signed up to OHADA. OHADA is, is the supreme over Cameroonian law on this particular issue. It was the contract governed by OHADA. So, you know, I think that it has a, a very good role it, to play. It has the, the experience. Uh, it's done a number of cases and, and they have a very snazzy uh, website, actually. <laughs> um, so uh, they've do, they're doing all the they're doing all the right things at any rate. Thank you very much. And um, Prince Alex, how, how do your views of the role of the HADA Court of Justice and Arbitration align with uh, my leaders? Well, so Melita thinks they're doing all the right things. Um, and I think it's, that's probably the case. Um, I think there's room for a lot more because, um, and initially when I thought about um, this issue, one of the things that I thought about was, um, you know, capacity building. And But then it seemed to me that it's an issue that's somewhat of a flaw when people talk, talk about, um, you know, the competency of um, institutions or um, the appeal of arbitration in Africa generally. But then an, an experience I had um, very recently, you know, you know somewhat um, made that, uh, made me rethink that. And which is, um, so back in 2017, I, I, I interned at a permanent color arbitration um, and also at the um, ICA, the International Council for Commercial Arbitration. And one of the things I, I did at ICA was help this um, South African um, or help ICA with what we um, a, like a roadmap for um, restructuring the, the 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 arbitration law of a South African um, um, country, and the the attorney who was um, at the Ministry of Justice at the time um, reached out to me six years later, um, sometime this year. And then she was asking for help with figuring out um, what arbitration rules and, and and everything that should go, arbitration agreement that should go into um, a contract between that country and a Nigerian um, party. And then I thought to myself, we had done with, I thought we had done enough in 2017 to at least um, for this country to have the minimal competence, for the lawyers in the Ministry of Justice to have the minimal competence to be able to handle things like that. 
Um, but six years later, here I was helping um, um, that attorney with something as um, rudimentary as that. And so it seems to me that there's still so much that, that can be done at, at that level um, of capacity building um, in the region. And Ohada is uniquely situated to do that because um, it's in a, in a very strange way, the, the 17 members of the oh, of Ohada sort of, because they have um, harmonized um, laws and setting um, issues, they have these very closely knit, um, you know, legal regimes and certain things. And I think that, and I don't imagine that they don't do this, but I think that Nohara can leverage that to sort of, you know, improve um, either the perception or the capacity available in, in those regions. But then I would also say that the, the challenge with international promoting international arbitration in, in certain regions of Africa, outside of maybe Nigeria, South Africa, and the very popular um, um, states, is something. And I touched up on this initially. It's 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 not unique to you know African um, you know Africa. It takes time you know for institutions to build the reputation that makes people want to go there. There are of course the obvious issues of um, corruption and just the incompetence of the people. But I also think that those aren't really the reasons why people aren't using um, institutions or why international arbitration isn't very popular. It's just that it takes time. Um, and I, I think that's that. And Ohara can do all it can, but it's those things sort of, um, you know, over time, the results begin to show. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much. And I'm going to, uh just ask you to continue on another topic. And we're running a little behind, so maybe we can um, shorten our answers just to, just to by a minute or so. Um, but Prince Alex, I wanted you to address some of the most uh, recent legislative and judicial developments concerning arbitration institutions in Africa. Yeah, this will probably take less than a minute. So, <laughs> all right. So um, I, the first that comes to mind is Nigeria, um, probably because it's the, the reform of the um, arbitration law in Nigeria was pretty extensive um, because Nigeria is very big. It's probably the most important market in, in Africa. Um, it, how people relate to Nigeria often has an outsized effect on how they think about um, the rest of um, the continent. Rightly or wrongly, I think wrongly, because South Africa is a much more mature legal, um, oh, well, a much more mature legal um, 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 jurisdiction than than the Nigeria. I would, I would think so, and a much more um, market as well. However, Nigeria reformed its arbitration um, law this year and made made very um, extensive um, reforms. I'm not going to go through all of those, um, but if you've ever had anything to do with Nigeria, um, you'd know that there were, we had this um, hangover from while the UK moved forward from a lot of the things they, you know, sort of um, introduced into the Nigerian legal system during the colonial period. We stuck with some of them, such as um, the common law. Um, 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 a, a common law principles of champerty, for instance, you couldn't get third party funding for international arbitration in Nigeria. And I remember back in 2016, we were advising a couple of um, Chinese entities who were um, thinking about arbitrating a dispute with a couple of governments in Nigeria. And their concern was, could they get a third party funding? Because they couldn't, because in Nigeria that would be viewed as champati, um, that didn't move forward. Um, the arbitration didn't move forward. But right now, you, the, the new laws, you know, made away with that, and a couple of other very important um, um, innovations. The other um, region, or, or rather country, Nigeria, that had um, new law, uh, a new arbitration law, like Sierra Leone, and Angola as well. Um, and finally, I'll just mention, and it's been talked a, a bit about, which is the um, the model built by the African Arbitration Academy. It's useful. It's not a legislation, but it's useful because some of the aims, um, it, 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 or rather it's set aims sort of underscore um, the areas needed and the areas of, um, for improvement. Um, and hopefully because of its um, popularity and why the way it was widely received, it's the hope is that it's, it, it helps with um, advancing um, the cost of um, arbitral institutions um, in, the, in, in the continent. 
Thank you very much. Um, Mohammed, are there legislative or judicial developments that you'd like to comment on? Um, I, I would just say that I think both of them um, go uh, hand in hand, like the legislative development and the judicial uh, development, because I think in most of the African countries right now, we have some sort of like developed uh, legislations addressing uh, 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 arbitration in general. Um, uh, and even if they don't, they are in the way of doing that. But I think the critical role is uh, how the judiciary will intervene in applying these legislative uh, developments. Uh, one example that I gave before about the Chevron case in uh, in Egypt about this uh, arbitral institution, alleged arbitral institution, uh, that that conduct actually was referred to the court, to the Egyptian courts, uh, as a criminal conduct, as uh, 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 like for alleged forgery and uh, manipulation of the process. And the court convicted the people in charge of that institution for forgery uh, because it was a sham process, according to the court. And that decision was reaffirmed on appeal and they were convicted uh, uh, for prison, I think for one year, uh, if I remember exactly. And I addressed that all in uh, one of my recently published article uh, about the role of arbitral institutions in uh, in Egypt uh, in line with the New York uh, Convention. So that's uh, that's one thing. So I think they both should go hand in hand in order to uh, address uh, uh, and uh, nurture the culture of arbitration in Africa. The other point that I want to say is uh, arbitral institutions are doing a great job, especially the competent one. And one example for that is uh, the Kigali uh, International Arbitration Center. Uh, right now, they have more than 300 cases that they handle, uh, and that's a manifestation of how competent that institution is and how much trust and confidence the arbitration users have in that, uh, in that uh, 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 institution. And um, uh, one of my friends, like Thomas Kindra, like from Hogan Lovells in Europe, um, he is in the board of that center, and uh, uh, I, I spoke with him a lot about that, and uh, uh, he reaffirmed my uh, my points about this. And also, there is something, um, uh, it's called AFRICARB. Uh, this uh, is like uh, an initiative made by some African uh, practitioners uh, uh, to cooperate with the arbitral institutions in order to develop and uh, 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 enlarge the audience for the Africa arbitration in general. So I would urge all of you like to sign up for this uh, and have the newsletter also. Thank you, Mohammed. Um, Melita, I wanted to turn to you next and ask you what you see as um, key challenges facing arbitra um, African arbitration institutions. Sure, and I, I think we've talked some about these anyway through our, our conversation this afternoon, but uh, I, I think, I guess I'm, in answering that question, I'm starting from the assumption that what we're thinking about is is actually international arbitration and keeping or bringing more international arbitration uh, to African countries or to the regions in Africa uh, or keeping uh, at least uh, intra-African uh, arbitration, which is international anyway, uh, in Africa. So I, I'm starting with, with that assumption. So I think the, the you know, we've talked about some of the issues with, with the institutions and co having confidence that they're going to be competent. Uh, I think that's a, a big issue and that manifests itself in, in different ways. Um, you know, you have to have the customers, right? You, you, any any institution, that's that's the way it's going to work. Uh, and that takes time as, as, as Prince Alex has said, you know, it takes time to build that. I mean, the you know, the, the ICC has been around for 100 years or whatever it is. So it all takes time. But having these features of being trusted uh, is what helps to get you there. Um, uh, so there is definitely a preference for sort of more international or larger and uh, institutions because the people who are making the decision about what rules to put in have to answer to somebody. Uh, and if something goes wrong, you lose. <laughs> then if you chose the wrong institution or you can't get, it's not easy to, to, there wasn't scrutiny, there wasn't this, there wasn't that. Anything is going to come back and haunt you as a person who made the decision. Uh, so that, you know, it's, it's a matter of um, uh, education in, in that sense. Uh, it, and as, as we've said, we've talked about caseload. We've talked about the fact that, um, you know, it's not there yet, but 
300 cases, uh, thousands of cases. Uh, I think, you know, these institutions are positioned to, to be there. There has to be, I'm not sure if it's a marketing issue for some of them, uh, to, to sort of get around some of the perceptions uh, that they're, that, that they're going to be, that there is. Um, courts, I mean, courts have to support the, um, the institutions in the sense of um, where they do go to courts for annulment or enforcement, the courts have to support that. And, and or before you even get there, if you, if you still have challenges to um, uh, the arbitrability or, or to, to the case going forward, I mean, I, I think 30 years ago, you still had a lot of cases in, in New York where uh, parties were tying up an arbitration for a year and a half, two years. That's only 30 years ago. Um, so it's a matter of the courts also saying, no, you chose arbitration, go to arbitration. Um, I think there's some issues around whether or not all of the states have adapted, uh, adopted the New York Convention. So I think that's, you know, a big one because there's no point to arbitration if you can't enforce your award. Um, uh, and, and also, I think in terms of the courts, there may still be some perception that there may be biases in favor of, of the state or a state-owned entity. Uh, and that, I think, is uh, one that really does matter. And then last but not least, uh, corruption. The reality, the perception, uh, is it an unconscious or a conscious bias? I mean, I, I think that factors into it also, and we don't necessarily always know which one it is, but um, it's on a spectrum, perhaps, but I think that is still uh, an issue and a challenge. Um, you know, some foreign entities are simply not going to um, trust the the local institutions, and it may be that if you're from a major institution in a Nigeria or in, in South Africa, you may not trust another um, local institution in another country. Mm -hmm. So I, I think those are sort of the some of the big challenges. Thank you very much. Um, Prince Alex, do you want to uh, talk about what you see as the uh, key challenges? Yeah, I'll just think of two, and, and those two are reputation, which I've talked and talk, talked a lot about, and, and, and power imbalance, so reputation. Um, so 10, maybe 15 years ago, the, the Singapore International Arbitration Center wasn't what it is today. And it all sort of changed with just affixing those two words, Gary Bourne to SIAC. Um, and, and I think if you if you thought about, um, say for instance, the um, Arbitration Foundation of South Africa, which is an impressive um, arbitral institution, has over 4,000 um, caseload, but very few people even know, know about it and how good it is. So I think that for very good arbitral institutions in Africa like, like that, um, they just have to find ways to build uh, or rather to, you know, um, you know, burnish their reputations. Um, and then secondly, um, power imbalance. So, um, and Ronke talked about this uh, probably very aptly um, by not saying much about it, by just saying power. And which is the fact that parties, uh, and from my experience um, in, when, I was, when I was an associate in a Nigerian law firm, the parties to contracts, multinationals and Nigerian parties, the terms going into those contracts were dictated by the power imbalance in those relationships, right? The multinationals just didn't want to have anything to do with the African institutions. It was simple. They wanted institutions they were comfortable with, familiar with, it really had nothing to do with any notions of, you know, the in, in, you know ineptitudes of the African institutions. Just simply was that they were more familiar. Um, with um, Western institutions. So as the, the power dynamic changes, and you can see this with the CETAC, the, the, um, China, right? Where you want you want a, a piece of the um, one, uh, one Belt Road, uh, Belt and Road Initiative. If you want a piece of that pie, you have to arbitrate, um, you know, um, CETAC, right? So regardless of how poor, how good the arbitrators there or how the institution the CETAC is, you have to go there. And so I think that with the in, in, with the GDPs of African countries um, getting, um, becoming like Nigeria, just um, improving year on year, 
th those imbalances sort of, you know, maybe not be as pronounced as they used to be. And then people negotiating these contracts can say, well, I think we should use the Lagos Code Arbitration. It's good enough. And they can you know, stand their ground because they know you really need the business from, from, from Nigeria. Thank you very much. Okay, we're at our last question. You each have two minutes. Um, and the question is, what are the most promising strategies for addressing the challenges facing African arbitration institutes, institutions? And Mohammed, we're gonna start with you. Uh, thank you, Victoria. I think the first, um, I think um, three points I will raise here as challenges and how to overcome them. The first one is how to develop the culture of arbitration in Africa through the arbitral institutions. Um, in building a culture of arbitration, a lot has to do with the judiciary and the government. And as I said before, they both go hand in hand in uh, nurturing the culture of arbitration in Africa. Um, and just like have this term from me, training by Africans for Africans. That is very important. And that would yield better results since there will be no gap in terms of the, the arbitration culture in Africa between the trainers and the trainees. Um, uh, that leads me to the, the, the other point, which is uh, arbitral institutions have to have local leadership, not international leadership in Africa, in order to contribute into developing the culture of arbitration uh, within the jurisdictional boundaries. Um, um, if the arbitral institutions in Africa are occupied by the same people who basically occupy the Western institutions, arbitration users would see no benefit of going to the arbitral institutions in Africa to conduct their disputes because they will have the same uh, uh, results. And the fact that it's cheaper than the Western institutions, it doesn't mean that it is better. The second point that I would uh, 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 argue here for the recommendations and the better strategy is building the trust with the arbitration users, which is also something that we have been talking about this afternoon. Um, I think that arbitral institutions in, in Africa shouldn't always look to the Western institutions to give them legitimacy. That is okay, but it's not enough. You cannot command the trust and respect by the arbitration users. That takes time and comes through the governance of these institutions. And the last point I would uh, address, which uh, uh, will be the uh, better mechanisms for the arbitrator's choice. I guess some initiatives like the arbitrator intelligence are critical to the development of the performance of the arbitral institutions and the appointment of arbitrators in Africa. Through this, the parties will be encouraged to fill out questionnaires about the performance of each arbitrator, and that will help the parties in the future disputes to evaluate the performance of each arbitrator uh, in terms of choosing these arbitrators in the future or not. And I think uh, if African arbitral institutions adopt that mechanism, that will yield uh, that would yield a better arbitration practice, uh, and they should consider that. Thank you very much. Um, Prince Alex, same question. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say they should stay the course. Um, we're going to get there and, and to probably get more um, outreach, right? Get more people on the rolls uh, and these are virtual institutions because at the end of the day, it's um, practitioners who usually think of, you know, what um, arbitral institutions to include in, in, in their dispute, um, in, in their contracts. So I would say try to get more people on, on the rolls of on those institutions so that you you know, you come first in mind. Mm -hmm. Melita, we'll uh, finish with you. Sure, and I, I, I would say briefly, uh, capacity building, capacity building, capacity building. Uh, I mean, that's key. I would also say, and I, I think I mentioned this before, um, sort of marketing, and and uh, if that's if what that means is getting a snazzy, fancy name person to come for a while, and I don't think that's necessarily totally wrong. I think you can have that and still have the day to day sort of running and face of the institution be local. Uh, but if what you want is attention and and like it or not, lending some legitimacy to the institution by someone risking their name to it, then I think, you know, it's a, a, a win win for both sides. I don't disagree with that, but I'm saying it's not enough. <laughs> OK, OK, thanks very much. I think we have time for some questions. Yeah. And I have a question. Oh, OK. <laughs> 
Um, so my question um, goes to uh, um, the idea of um, increasing the competitiveness of the of African arbitration institutions. I'm going to go to something that Mohammed said, um, which is that the Kigali Center has um, experienced success in a growing caseload due to the good reputation of that institution. And there are many institutions with great reputations. Um, and I think that's true, but I think also um, the caseload has driven the, the reputation, right? And that's partly um, a result of the attorney general directing government um, or I'm sorry, state-owned enterprises to at the very least take the negotiating position that arbitrations are going to be held at the Kigali Center, right? And that's increased the number of, of arbitrations there, which in turn improves the reputation. So now stepping out and looking at the entire um, uh, landscape, isn't part of the problem that there's so much competition between these different institutions and it's very difficult for one to emerge as kind of like, you know, the leader on the continent. And if that is the case, um, I'd be really interested to hear thoughts on um, how to address that. Like, should we be considering um, consolidating around a single center as the one that, you know, is being endorsed by institutions? And if so, then how, how should we be thinking about going doing going about doing that? Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. And um, who wants to uh, answer? You go first. <laughs> So I, I I guess what I would say is, do, do you really want to have only sort of one rise to the top, though? I mean, I don't think so. Institutions may eventually become sort of specialized in certain kinds of cases. But I think where you have, you know, there's been some discussion backlash in terms of a lot of institutions moving to say, okay, if it's a, a $2 million in dispute case or a $4 million in dispute case, we're only going to do it this way. Um, maybe there's a market for that because in some parts of the world, that's not going to be such a small case. So why say that, you know, we'll have another SEAC or ICC in Africa? Why not have different ones uh, in different areas satisfying different needs? Why should someone who has a $2 million claim have to travel 14 hours to to get there? Just, you know, they're not going to because of the the new rules on 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 expediting small claims. But why not just have that be more convenient and have regional um, centers? Yeah, I, I think I would agree with that. I would add only that I think competition is very healthy for a better arbitration practice, either in Africa or anywhere. And the more options you have for competent and legitimate arbitral institutions to the parties the better arbitration practice you will have, and that will give uh, different parties uh, more choices in agreeing in their arbitration agreement to a, a, a specific institution or another. And that will also reflect on um, um, the institutions will be uh, 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 for the watch out to develop their rules to better tailor with whatever needs the parties uh, uh, want or, uh, or the parties have for a better arbitration proceedings. But if we concentrate all of these efforts into uh, like one regional or one big arbitral institutions, I think that wouldn't benefit the arbitration practice and it will uh, 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 affect uh, adversely the uh, the, arbit uh, the choice uh, uh, of uh, the, uh, 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 the parties to the arbitration agreement, so. Okay, I think we have time for at least one more question. So um, let's start. Over there. Thank you. Um, I'm curious about South South um, um, engagement and learning. Um, so, compared to Latin America, um, I think that in Latin America, the arbitration framework has been strong uh, and, um, and, and has really stood the test of time. So, what can, uh, what did they do right? Uh, uh, um, and what can African countries learn from Latin America? 
And as African countries now engage with China and others, what can they do differently? So what are the lessons from South-South engagement and cooperation? Could that be a way to strengthen the arbitral institutions in Africa? And the, what is the role of state-owned enterprises in Africa? Yes, power is important, but even when African countries have the power, they often cede it. And, and so is, do the state, role, uh, state enterprises have a role in contributing to the strengthening of the institutions? And do they even understand that they have a role? Because even when state enterprises among African countries get into um, agreements, they don't often put African institutions. They still send it outside. And that is troubling on multiple levels. Thank you. Thank you. Um, would somebody like to address that, Prince Alex? Yeah, I'll just um, address the issue of state-owned enterprises. And it's true because I, I recall there was a study, and I, 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 but that was maybe two years ago, um, that came out about how intra-African disputes weren't being resolved in, in Africa. And so we can't always make the argument that it's it's always a, it's always a consequence of, of the imbalance um, between um, the bargaining powers of the parties. Um, I think that um, state-owned enterprises and multinationals like the Dangotes of, of Africa have a huge, um, and, and I think the point is that they don't realize that they have that um, power, but, Probably it falls back on on uh, practitioners who have ties with with you know with the region to do a lot more in trying to you know sensitize um, the state and enterprises. Alternative people we know in, in those places about the roles they can play in ensuring that disputes that arise from transactions they're involved in are resolved in 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 the in the forum because in those cases they wield all the power. And I think we probably should do a little bit more in that regard. I, I can add quickly one thing about Latin America is language is is a key factor in that. Um, you know, it, it, so you choose arbitrators because they need to be able to understand the language, write in the language, um, uh, and also getting back to state of, so that's that's one factor there's institutionalized arbitration in, in the biggest markets in latin america um state owned entities or state entities are required to arbitrate their their contracts their big contracts require arbitration you might be domestic or it might be international depending on the amount in in controversy but they're required to arbitrate so that automatically is a big uh, source of business. Uh, but language, and quite frankly, language leads to also the diversity issue, which is they're choosing uh, increasingly Latin Americans to arbitrate these disputes. Uh, and they choose Latin American firms. Uh, and it doesn't mean that you, you don't have outsiders. You do, depending on the kind of case. But, um, you know, it builds, you build the capacity by having the experience in their you know, having the people who can respond to the market. And so I think that's a factor. I, I think certainly there's there's a perception that um, in, in a lot of African countries, they you tend to go back to, if it's a French, former French colony, you go to the French law firms, excellent uh, arbitration practitioners, of course, or you go to a, if it's an Anglo country, a, you know, KC in, in England, which could be, could not be the best thing. Um, so I think that's, or you go to your cousin, which is not, or the cousin of the president, which may not be the best thing to do. So there are those factors. Uh, I think I may, add, I may add something here. I think it's not just about the choice of the arbitral institutions. It goes also, the challenge goes also to the choice of the arbitrators, because we see this a lot in the exit cases, the investor state uh, uh, arbitration cases, we find some arbitrators who always favor the state and some arbitrators who uh, are more inclined to favor the investors. So if the dispute is specifically uh, uh, involves a, a state entity, uh, a state-owned entity, uh, I, I think uh, uh, we we shouldn't be limited to just look at 
what are better institution will uh, administer this dispute but also if they get the power to appoint the arbitrator in that particular dispute because of the a default by one of the parties or whatever procedures we are following uh, who will be serving as an arbitrator in these cases because that's also a very important uh, uh, choice to be considered okay i think we can squeeze in one or two more questions I just wanted to know what are the some red flags that someone should be aware of when trying to differentiate between the institutions that are corrupt or incompetent and the ones that are just trying to build their reputation. So generally speaking, mistakes will will always be there, you know, like no matter where you could like, even if you are before the ICC, I shouldn't be saying that, but like it's whatever you are, you know, but I think there is. Uh, a distinction between an intentional mistake and just like a, a very uh, simple mistake that uh, everyone can uh, uh, fall prey to. Um, the problem, like with the example that I gave about the Chevron case, the arbitration agreement was very clear that this is an ad hoc arbitration and the seat is Geneva. And they changed it to like the, the, the claimant changed it to file before this center, this particular center that me personally, I wasn't aware of, I never heard of. Uh, except for that dispute. And uh, they said that the seat will be Cairo. And they are not allowed to do that. Like, like a first year associate will be able to distinguish between, yeah, this is proper or this is not proper. But I can't, I can't make like an exhaustive list of um, what constitutes competent and what constitutes incompetent. But you know, like the more you develop uh, your practice in arbitration, the more you will develop the sense of, yeah, that makes sense or no, that doesn't make any sense, you know? So that's what I can say for that. And I'm sorry for saying competent, incompetent, you know, like <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> okay, um, one more question right here. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, Mohanad and Murtadi. Uh, I'm going back to the competent and incompetent <laughs> issue. My question is, uh, you spoke, all of you, about, uh, first of all, competent and incompetent institutions, but also how do we um, improve the institutions and how do we, what what can we do of training? And, you know, we talked about all these things. On, on, now, on the other hand, we spoke on the earlier panel about efforts to uh, increase African uh, states' contribution to investment uh, or any kind of dispute settlement. And one of the, the, the ways to achieve that goal is to include provisions uh, requiring the, the parties to appoint an African uh, descendant arbitrator or uh, to select an institute that is in Africa. And the question that I have to you is whether you think the inclusion of such provisions is, is putting the cart before the horse given the problem with the institution, or do you think it's the other way around that doing that actually will help make the institutions more competent? Prince Alex, I know you, you had addressed this a little bit before, so do you wanna? Yeah, I'll just say, I think it helps. Um, it helps because we, and I talk based off of the experience um, we had in Nigeria, when we had, um, what's called in Nigerian content in, in the oil and gas industry. So the experience we had was that multinationals would, you know, employ, and I think um, um, Alice talk, touched upon this a little bit, and in in in, in what, what nationals would come in and they would appoint all the top tier um, staff would all be from Netherlands. So Shell, would, everybody's going to be from the Netherlands. And then the guys who, you know, clean the offices are going to be Nigerians. And, and so we had legislation that said, no, you, you, you know, it's not right to do that. This is a nascent industry. It needs, the only way it can grow, the only way it can grow, you know, Nigerians who can do the same thing is if they're actually learning on the job. And so we had a Nigerian content um, passed into law requiring that you have to hire a certain, um, you know, percentage of Nigerians as, you know, top level stuff. I mean, it, you weren't required to hire incompetent people, no. But you're required to hire, you know, Nigerians who could do the same thing. So you had to give that preference to Nigerians. I think it, it's worked for us. Um, Shell isn't operating in Nigeria anymore, but our oil and gas industry is still, to the extent that corruption, you know, slept some of it, it's still thriving. Um, so I think it could probably work. I'll, I'll just say very briefly, I, I think it can't hurt. Obviously, there has to be something that says, you know, uh, unless it's just impossible. Uh, but I, I happen to think that if you actually try to find uh, arbitrators who are African or African descent, you will find them. 
I think uh, I would al- I would only add one thing about the uh, the uh, uh, inclusion of the arbitral institutions in the arbitration agreements. I think the problem with that is um, uh, most of the people who draft the arbitration agreements they are not arbitration councils; they are transactional councils. And the problem is they don't consult with the arbitration experts in which institution to include, and that creates a lot of problems uh, uh, in practice. So. I would say that the better practice is at least the transactional attorneys who draft the contracts or the agreements should involve uh, uh, the arbitration councils when they draft the arbitration agreements because most of the procedural irregularity that we find in practice, it goes back to the time of drafting the arbitration agreement. So that's one thing that I would add here. Yeah, and I would say that goes for Africa and the rest of the world also. (laughs) I do Thank you, everyone. And to, um, and to let us all remember that CPR is at the forefront of contact and increasing the number of blacks involved in arbitration and mediation in the country in our world. And so, to your point, perhaps we'll be speaking to our that adds on to that as well, as well as Polly, which is the um, organization of African lawyers across the country. And I think there are 83,000. I can't remember the digital number of that. But they are co-op nation. And we know in this country, as well as in the UK and the rest of the world, the basis of arbitrators comes out of lawyers. So one of the things is to certainly rely on the black lawyers, the African lawyers, to create this problem, to rely on organizations like CPI. I don't want to counsel you because I have the audacity to just jump up <laughs> and say thank you to both panels for giving us so much inspiration. So much motivation and so much more that we know that we can do for all of us. So I'm going to pause. Thank you so much. That's such a superb note to end on. And I think it also helps answer the gentleman's question about distinguishing between competence and in the stage of building capacity. Consult Arbitration Council. Consult African Arbitration Council. Please uh, join me again in... um, in a very, very warm um, thank you to panel two that has given us an absolutely superb discussion. 